from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 45, recorded on August 21st, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on the Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to look at Paul's recent column, Project 2025 versus the Public's Health, Part 1, the CDC. So that looks like there are going to be multiple parts here. So, well, what is Project 2025? So it's a, a plan, a sort of conservative manifesto for how government agencies will be handled should there be um, a conservative uh, a president in the White House, specifically Donald Trump, if he's elected on November 5th of this year. Um, it, this is his basically blueprint blueprint for how um, we will manage government agencies, including agencies involved in the public's health. So in, in the article, you talk about how in the, in the document, it's an 800-page document, something like that, right? 900. <laughs> they claim that CDC completely failed during the COVID pandemic and want to remove CDC from all vaccination recommendations. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Right. So the statement, so I'll read it so um, you can see exactly what the quote is in Project 2025. Quote, never again should CDC officials be allowed to say in their official capacity that school children should be vaccinated. Such decisions should be left to parents and medical providers. So basically, they want to eliminate the recommending arm of the CDC. I think what's really behind this is that when the CDC says that a vaccine should be given, um, that usually triggers school mandates, which mm -hmm. are not federal. They're statewide or local. But usually they are built on that phrase, should be used. So I think it's not so much that they don't want vaccines to be given to school children. I think they just don't want them to be mandated to be given to school children, because that's sort of at the heart of this conservative notion of or libertarian notion of government off my back. I don't want the government telling me what to do. I can figure out what's best for myself and what's best for my family without government interference. And this is looked at as government's overreaching. So it, even if this happened, and we don't know if it, it would, so there would be no longer any CDC recommendations. So how would state health departments decide what to do? How indeed. I mean, <laughs> when, when vaccines are um, licensed by the Food and Drug Administration, um, that's based on um, advice from the the so-called VRPAC committee, a federal vaccine advisory committee, where you have a group of virologists and immunologists and public health people sitting around a table reading all of the, the data that pertain to that particular vaccine. They, they then uh, license its use, which is to say the CDC uh, allows a vaccine to be sold. But the recommending part of it comes from the CDC. And again, it's a group called the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, founded in 1964, so, you know, 60 years ago, um, which, again, is composed of experts who look through all those data and then make a recommendation or not. So sometimes they give a softer recommendation. They don't say it should be used. They say it may be considered or it should be shared decision making. It's a softer recommendation, which never triggers mandates. But once they say this is, is clearly a value and should be given, that usually triggers mandates. And I think that's what they want to eliminate. But in the process, they are throwing the baby out with the bathwater because then you lose that expertise. The assumption is that parents and, and physicians can make that decision without relying on that expertise. And that's just not right. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what's wrong with parents and medical providers making vaccination decisions? Well, so I'll give you an example from, you know, like 30 years ago. I remember when the, the varicella or chickenpox vaccine first came out in 1995. The uptake was very slow initially, but I remember parents um, calling me at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and saying, you know, I've done my research and I've decided not to get the chickenpox vaccine. Well, what doing your research really meant was looking on the Internet and reading other people's opinions about the vaccine. It didn't really mean doing your research. If you really wanted to do your research on the chickenpox vaccine in the mid-1990s, you would have 
have read the roughly 300 articles that had been published on the subject, which would have meant you would have had to have an expertise in virology, immunology, statistics, uh, epidemiology, and really few parents have that expertise, and frankly, few doctors have that expertise. So they look to these advisory groups that at least collectively have that expertise, at least collectively have read those papers, and can then make a reasonable decision for the public's health. And I think to, to eliminate that, that, that expertise, to assume that everybody's an expert um, is wrong, because if everybody's an expert, then no one's an expert, and I think this country will suffer that. Do you know, Paul, if any uh, physicians or public health individuals or epidemiologists or virologists were involved in writing this part of Project 2025? No, I can't imagine they would be. I mean, we certainly have benefited from the expertise of the CDC and the FDA, uh, the, benefited from the expertise of those advisory committees. Um, as a consequence, we have far fewer infections and hospitalizations and deaths because of that expertise. So to throw it away, I think, would be shameful. So essentially, the, the authors of this document are politicians. Yes, I think that's right. I, th I think the, the, the motivation here, the fuel here is one of government off my back. Don't tell us what to do. And I think it's all a consequence of what just happened over the last four years regarding COVID. I think COVID mandates really created an enormous backlash in this country. I think we leaned into this libertarian left hook, and you're seeing this backlash from that. And not just COVID vaccine mandates, but I think also masking mandates. I think people were really put off by that, the notion that they couldn't necessarily go to uh, the, their place of worship or a sporting event or a restaurant or school unless they were in business, unless they were vaccinated. And that really, really upset people. And this is, I think, the result, which would be a disastrous result. We, we, measles is the best example. I mean, we eliminated measles in this country in the year 2000 because of school mandates. That's mm -hmm. why. That's what got vaccine rates up. And um, to, to, to eliminate school mandates, you will only see these diseases come back again. And it's unconscionable. There's so much medicine we don't know. There's so much we can't do. This we know. This we can do. And it's hard to watch this. You write a lot in the column about how the ACIP and the CDC have collaborated over the years to prevent infectious diseases. Give us a sense about that, please. Right. So I actually came onto the ACIP in 1998. I was on the ACIP for about five years till 2003. But I, I watched us go through some pretty tough times during those few years, and it educated me. I mean, it was sort of the one, two, three hit against vaccines. On the one hand, there was a publication in 1998 by Andrew Wakefield claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella, or MMR vaccine caused autism. And this was my first uh, lesson the, about the, uh, the inseparability, if you will, of politics and public health. Because what happened was there was a, um, a person who was on the Appropriations Committee who basically asked us, the ACIP, to vote on whether or not these three vaccines should be separated into their component parts. Because Andrew Wakefield had claimed that if you wanted to avoid autism, just don't give these three vaccines together give them separately. So we actually voted on that inane notion of whether or not we should separate the vaccine into its three component parts, which would have meant that a, 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 a what is two doses of a vaccine would have become six doses of a vaccine for no benefit. And so we voted no, but we, we did get a chance to vote. I mean, had we not done that, had simply the government made that decision, they may have made the decision to separate it into its three component parts. The other thing was um, the rotavirus vaccine. Um, Rota uh, Shield was a vaccine that came onto the market again in, in 1999. It was found to be a rare cause of intussusception, which was intestinal blockage. So we looked at those data and decided that that, that was an unacceptable uh, risk. And ultimately, that vaccine came off of the market within 10 months of its coming onto the market because we had systems in place, like the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System or the Vaccine Safety Data Link, to pick that up quickly, to pick up that rare adverse event which was rare. I mean, between one in 10,000, one in 30,000 was picked up quickly. Um, and then the third thing was thimerosal, this ethylmercury-containing preservative, where I think um, 
That was sort of an example of how not to communicate a theoretical risk as we were using more and more vaccines, and therefore some of them had this uh, thimerosal, this uh, ethyl mercury containing preservative. Um, the decision was made to basically take that out of uh, of vaccines, even though at the level containing in vaccines it, it was safe. And I think that was uh, not us at our best. The um, morbidity and mortality weekly report statement from the public health service was, and I quote, um, all the evidence to date shows that thimerosal at the level containing in vaccines is safe. Safe, but to make vaccines even safer, we'll take it out. Well, if it's safe, then taking it out doesn't make it safer. It just made it perceived to be safer, which was a very different thing. But that was all sort of educational to me about the give and take between experts and and uh, and sort of the, the the public and in many ways the government. So ACIP is not a government uh, committee. No, it's it, it's a committee that advises the government. If you're on the, that committee, the same for the FDA vaccine advisor committees, you can have no association with the government and no association with pharmaceutical companies. You are an independent advisory committee, and that's important. It's important to be independent. And so, uh, Project Twenty Twenty Five would have no uh, no way of affecting ACIP, I presume. Well, assuming the ACIP still existed, or that mm. the FDA vaccine advisory committees existed, I mean, if you don't want advice. Then why have an advisory committee? Right. You start. I start to see that a little bit now with the FDA vaccine advisory committee. There's a sense that you know we make a recommendation, and do, do they really want us to make a recommendation? Because sometimes that pins mm-hmm. uh, the the uh, agency in to a situation that they didn't necessarily want. So it's as you say in the um, in the piece, the, the, this 2025 project 2025 basically doesn't want experts. Um, of any kind. And tell us, you use COVID as an example of why that wouldn't work. Tell us about that. Right. So, so, so I'm on the FDA vaccine advisory committee and have been since 2017. So when the, in December of 2020, when we, the committee was asked to consider these two mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer vaccine on December 10th, uh, the Moderna vaccine on December 17th, we were given um, basically 800 pages of information. So for the first vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, you got about 200 pages of information from the company, and then you got 200 pages of information from the government because the, the FDA looked through every piece of data and wanted to make sure that nothing was misrepresented or omitted. So you're looking through 400 pages of data, and that was true. Um, for the first vaccine, another 400 pages roughly for the second vaccine. And you read every word because you had to, because you know this was an awesome responsibility. You were bathed. This was a 40,000 person trial for Pfizer, a 30,000 person for Moderna, but it was one to one placebo controlled. So it was really 35,000 people who had gotten that vaccine for a vaccine that you know is going to be given to hundreds of millions and ultimately billions of people. So you want to see whether there's anything there that predicts what might happen once you give this to much larger numbers of people. You read every word of that document. But to read every word of that document, again, required some expertise in virology and and immunology and epidemiology. And so, um, and that was at least the collective expertise of that committee, as well as the CDC uh, Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices. And it it served us well. that, That vaccine, the mRNA vaccines, were estimated to save about 3 million lives, the, and those who chose not to get the vaccine, who willingly chose not to get a vaccine that was available, the estimate was about 230,000 people died unnecessarily when they chose to use their own expertise and ignore the expertise of these federal agencies. So basically, parents and medical providers who Project 2025 thinks should make the decision, they would not have been able to interpret these results from the, from the clinical trial. They wouldn't read it. I mean, I, I think it's a lot to ask people to read those 800 pages. I mean, some may and may have the expertise to do that, but I don't think that's the, the, the general public, nor do I think it's the, the physician, frankly, who's going to be able to necessarily have that kind of expertise to make that, those decisions. That's why they, they look to these advisory bodies for that information, and we've served them well. So, so I'm, I'm wondering, there are other experts in the world. There are medical doctors, surgeons, there are pilots of airplanes, there are engineers. Do they want to eliminate all that expertise as well? <laughs> um, one gets the sense that they want the federal government to back away from um, what has traditionally been their role of regulating and advising. Well, the, the FAA regulates air traffic, right? They're going to get rid of that too. That would be something. Oh my gosh. How could this happen? How could CDC be muffled? What would it take? Just a presidential order or does it have to be Congress or what? Do you know? Um, I think well, it's certainly the CDC serves is, is part of the H is part of HHS, which mm-hmm. is part of the executive branch. So I think this all comes down from the executive branch would be my guess. But again, I'm not right. a 
political scientist. Um, I guess you would have to work hard to gut it, but it would be possible. And, and you know, you see now that the, the sort of the fear that surrounds this issue regarding abortion. I mean, there are uh, mm-hmm. physicians who have, at least if you believe the reports that are on television or in the news, there are physicians who will see someone who, say, has an ectopic pregnancy, meaning a pregnancy that's occurring in the fallopian tube and not in the uterus, which is potentially fatal a uh, problem, and certainly for the mother and the child, um, who are afraid to do an abortion because mm-hmm. they fear they may be uh, under scrutiny from from the law, and that's uh, it's just not doctors doing what they're asked to do, which is to take care of their patients. And I just worry that they're going to ask these advisory committees or the agencies themselves to back away from what is a critical role. Of course, would, the CDC director could also have a role in this as well, right? Yes. Other than CDC, what else does in, in terms of healthcare related issues? What else does Project Twenty Twenty Five uh, want to? Eliminate. Right. So I, I th- so we wrote the first subsection. We're doing now this uh, video, but I think mm-hmm. next week I'm going to talk about the Project 2025's uh, influence or what they they would hope happens with the FDA. Then the week after that, we'll talk about the National Institutes of Health. Folks, you can decide with your vote on this. This is really important for the health of the nation, and uh, you know we're Paul and I are very concerned. Many other people are very concerned. So. Please think about it very carefully. We'll put a link to Paul's column in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.